Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Today we have in the audience with it, or in the, uh, uh, by via Skype, Avi uh, from Israel, who was actually there not during the time of the, uh, the Amona uh, uh, residents being evacuated or forced out of their homes after about 20 years of living in this region here, but Avi was there the, the day before and is very uh, familiar with the residents there and these trouble and the things that they have suffered there and he was kind enough to come up, come on here with us here on Israeli News Live to share with us some of the insights that he knows firsthand from the friends that he has that lives in Amona. Avi, thank you so much for coming on and being on us here on Israeli News Live today. Thank you for having me, Steve. So, Avi, I want to ask you something. Uh, of course, most people probably know just from reading news articles that uh, the Amona residents have been there for close to 20 years or maybe a little over, if you forget exactly how long. Um, and there's debate as far as to how this came up. I have seen in some of the news sources that uh, people are saying that, uh, uh, you know, of course, the, 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 the uh, I don't, I don't know if we should say far right or far left, but we have some groups that are saying that the land was uh, illegally uh, taken from Palestinian owners, but from what I take, can gather on it, this land originally did not so much have an ownership, but it was that uh, it was land that was able to be built upon, but because those on the far left decided that they wanted to uh, take this land back for whatever the purposes may be, they seemingly found uh, some supposed owner of this land, and that's what has started all of this. Do, do you know anything about that type of information? I can, I'm actually familiar with the facts, and I can share them with you. Um, uh, it's kind of sad because it is a story of how you see facts don't matter in our world anymore. Um, and there are plenty of journalists and media who do not take out the time to even, even research the facts. And when you hear the facts, it's actually very absurd and sad. So I'll go through it very as quickly as I can. Fact number one, people have to understand that between 1948 and 1967, what we call the area of Judea and Samaria, historically that it, is the name of the area that the world likes to call the West Bank. It was illegally occupied by Jordan. So King Hussein illegally occupied the West Bank for 19 years. The world did not recognize that illegal occupation, right? That land was not supposed to be given over to Jordan. Um, and not only that, all the Arabs living there were given Jordanian citizenship. There was no one called Palestinian between 1948 and 1967. There just was no nation in the world known by that name during those during those years. In any case, for those 19 years, when, when King of Hussein of Jordan illegally occupied that land, he handed out parcels of that land to cronies of his, whether friends and family. Some of them lived in the area. Most of them did not. Most of them lived in Jordan. Hardly any of them ever used the land that was parceled out to them by the king. And that land has been laid desolate ever since. So now when you think about it, the papers that were given to show legal status of Arab ownership were these papers given to them by King Hussein. So if you think about it, you're talking about an illegal occupier illegally handing out pieces of land to cronies for no good reason just because he's the king. And that is, and, and that is the paperwork that is being used to prove that it belongs to some Arabs and doesn't even belong to the Jews. So that's absurd number one. Um, and unfortunately, the Israeli court system, it, it, it gives legal status to this paperwork from an illegal occupation of King Hussein of Jordan, even though there is no legal status because it was not his. He was illegally occupying that land, and that land has laid desolate ever since. Again, Avi, Avi let's, let's, before you go to the next point there, you bring out a good point because this is what we've noticed as well. Uh, as you said, you have to look at the legalities involved in here. And, of course, we can go back to uh, 1920, uh, or even before 1920. When we look at the fact that, the, uh, that at, at the time that uh, the, second, or excuse me, the First World War, when the First World War had come into place there, and we see that um, uh, the, the British had overthrown the British Empire there, all the land, even those of you that are watching right now on your screen, you can see here now, uh, you see the side in yellow and the side in white. We see what they call Jewish Palestine, which most Israelis don't like that, to use that word because the Palestinian 
uh, so-called Palestinian people, the Arab people that are living inside of the West Bank, are using this name for themselves. And the side to the uh, right of your screen, the Transjordan uh, that you see right in here, all of this land was mandated as a Jewish homeland for the Jewish people. And, you know, I'll be one thing that a lot of people are not aware of, and that is that even before the British mandate that gave this land as a Jewish homeland, we actually had 80,000 Jewish families living inside of what is called modern-day Israel uh, that were near Tel Aviv, etc., that had purchased land even under uh, the laws of the Ottoman Empire. And so we had already begun right. to build a, a, a large population there. And the Arabic peoples that were living, everything from what is called, the, what was given up, by the way, in 1922. This side here was 77% was of the land that was promised to the Jewish people for their own homeland, which is like a postage stamp on the size of the United States as far as land and on the earth there is. Uh, they were given for a place for our people to return home and to be able to live in peace. That was given all the way to Abdullah uh, Hussein's son as a gift by the British, uh, which clearly you can see this in Daniel's prophecy, chapter 11, they just divide up our land for gain. Uh, so for, for some kind of present. And now Avi is bringing this in. And of course, by the way, everything west of the Jordan, according to 1922 League of Nations, was now going to be given for the Jewish homeland. So the Jewish people, okay, we, we sucked it in. We took a 77% land loss and our forefathers accepted everything west of the Jordan. And as Avi brought in, what are we seeing now? Now we're seeing that they want to take and divide that again. And it is. I, I did not even know. Avi, this is, this is blowing me away. I had no idea they were using documents from King Hussein to justify land ownership when, as you said, right. it was an occupation. And, and right. anybody that does any research knows during the, during the five or six years during World War II, uh, b before the, the new resolution came out, they stopped all Jews from being allowed to come in to, uh, to Israel's homeland. And yet it was promised to us. And instead, the, the British turned their backs on uh, all the illegal immigration that was coming in from Transjordan now and also from Egypt. So there were these people came in illegally against a resolution that was already passed by what we would call the United Nations or the League of Nations, the same entity, the same body of uh, government there. And yet they expect the Jewish people to be able to accept this and that we should even believe anything the United Nations would say today. And of course, Resolution 181 again wants to carve it out. And as you said, the land that was occupied by the Jordanians because they took it during the 48 war. They, they, were, they were the occupiers and then they give this land over as a reward. This is absolutely absurd and completely insane. Uh, Avi, let's go to that next point that you have there. This is very interesting. Right, and again, what saddens me as an Israeli citizen is that my legal system is using paperwork from an illegal occupation to prove ownership of a uh, fake ownership of land that wasn't even allowed to be given out in the first place and that is the legal standing of what is called today private ownership people have to understand when when the when the language of arab private ownership is used when it comes to the west bank it does not mean that someone actually owns that land it just means wow. that there's a piece of paper from jordan's illegal occupation stating that some under some name this paper was written that this land was given to him even though there has never been a house there there has never been fields there anyone who knows and sees the land it is barren land the yes. hill of amona was barren land forever Actually, you have ancient you have ancient water cisterns and wine factories that were there when the Jews were there thousands of years ago. But since then, it has been barren, and the Jews resettled that land like we do throughout the land. So that is the yes. absurd point, legal point that first has to be understood. Let's put that aside and go on to point number two. For those who want to still say that there is some legal standing to these illegal documents from King Jordan, let's just say they actually have some legal standing. The land of Amona, we're going to go into a little real estate dialogue right now. It is around 80 dunams. Dunams is around, uh, around I think there's four acres to, the, to, to a dunam. So let's say it's around right. 20 acres of land, right? So the village of Amona is on 20 acres of land. The legal question of questionable land is only 2% of those 20 acres. 
So you had the Supreme Court of Israel coming to a decision that, you know what, because of the 2% questionable legal status that only has like two or three houses on it, instead of dealing just with those two or three problematic houses, right, because the land that is questionable is uh, legal standing is only 2%, which only has two houses on it. So instead of saying, let's come up with a solution for these two houses, they say, no, let's destroy the whole 20-acre village. That makes no legal sense whatsoever. No legal sense whatsoever. It is ludicrous. It is crazy. It is downright wrong and unjust and immoral. I've been very outspoken in saying that this is the rule of law being hijacked by an ideological agenda that has nothing to do with law or legal private property status. So it is really very, very upsetting both points. Point number one, this shouldn't be an issue at all. Point number two, even if you do consider it an issue, the ultimate legal solution or legal ruling of destroying a whole 20-acre village makes no legal sense whatsoever, and it is immoral. I will go even more than that. And again, I've said it quite, I don't know how much you've gone into these details with your, with your listening audience. I believe the whole world is going through this same battle that Israel is going through, where you have an ideological elite progressive yes. society who are a minority mostly who are setting the agenda and uh, and 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 harnessing and taking advantage of their positions in the law legal justice systems to enforce their ideological agendas even though it gets it goes against the will of the people and the democratically elected elected governments so what i'm about to say is here we had a case one of the judges who have ruled against so solving this issue for the 42 families of Amona and in a sense allowed for their homes to be destroyed even though they have no other place to live they're homeless right now the day just two days ago that same judge was involved in a similar case where there is a legal squatter an Arab Muslim family squatting in proven legally Jewish property in the outskirts of Jerusalem now, here there is all the documentation, not from an illegal occupation of Jordan, but from real legal documentation. The court system has proven, the lower courts have proven that it is Jewish property that the Arab family must be evacuated because they are squatting, right? When you are squatting illegally, yes. after you are removed. Well, the Arab family, um, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, what's the word when you go up to the higher court system? They uh, uh, appealed it. They appealed the case. They, they in. appealed, right? They appealed to the Israeli Supreme Court, and this judge got this case, and he ruled that they should not be evacuated. Why? Even though, again, the lower court system had the proof that it was Jewish owned, they are squatters. The upper court, the Supreme Court judge, said because they will be without home and roof, and that is a humanitarian situation, we don't want to, we don't want to cause. They will not. They should not be evacuated from that home. So this Jewish family that owns its home is now left having to accept an illegal squatting situation that has been given a kosher symbol. Basically, it's been allowed by the law. So you see, what this same judge in one case uses human human humanitarian um, logic that has nothing to do with the law in order to allow an Arab Muslim family to illegally squat Jewish property, but yet a whole village of 42 families that is questionably legal status, with only 2% of the land in question, it decides to have them all forcibly expelled, 42 homes destroyed, and all these families out in the streets. So it is very clear that this is an ideological agenda. And again, I'm yes. bringing this up as a case in Israel, but this is happening all over the world, where this cultural progressive elite are taking advantage of their positions, and they are enforcing their agenda, overruling the will of the people and the mandate that governments are given. You know, Avi, that's exactly right what you're saying. And I was not aware of the case of the Arabic family. But then, what, as you say then, then there is no justice in the law because uh, what's happening then with, with the, uh, the case of the Israelis in that are living there uh, in Amona, why didn't they use the same justifications uh, for them? And, and they're not. They're, they're not. They're, ju they're just doing it. Now, you bring out a very interesting point, the elite that are actually controlling this. And this is what we have been watching ourselves uh, on Israeli News Live. We have seen this very much, that 
there is someone outside that is controlling what goes on. And as you said, not just, uh, not just Israel, it is a global uh, event. Uh, and, and in fact, I was just looking at the case with uh, President Trump. He does the uh, ban on Muslims coming in from uh, seven, uh, excuse, I think seven different nations to come into the United States. But one federal judge has the ability to override his authority and change the entire yeah. thing. Same thing we saw in Israel, even in the case of Amona, it was not that there was Prime Minister Netanyahu that, that caused the eviction, but instead it was a it was the uh, Supreme Court of the land or, or one of the... Yeah, the Supreme Court forced the government's hand yes. to go against government policy. The government has been trying to come up with solutions so that this would be solved. There are so, there, there's a very important statement that I think must be mentioned. Where there is a will, there is a way. Even according to the law, when there, where there is a will there is a way if the problem was only two percent of the land then you come up with a solution and again you just mentioned trump and the immigration ban also england britain and the brexit right brexit was a referendum for the people and then you see the supreme court not overturn it but try to push it so that it has to be gone to the go back to parliament again i'm not going into the british system but you see an overextension of the legal system coming in and playing a ideological card to try to overturn or change things that are not going according to their agenda. Exactly. Avi, another thing that I find interesting, you know, when, when Trump, for example, banned the, the Muslims, and he did it as a temporary ban, what was interesting is one of the former parliament members in Britain it actually stood up uh, and made a statement. She says, what's well, interesting that the world will protest against uh, uh, Trump's ban on Muslims, a temporary ban, but yet there are, what, 16 nations that have bans on Israelis coming into their country. Where is the protest now cry to this? Uh, I'm really Correct. starting to see a major anti-Semitic move against the Jewish people more so than ever before. Uh, and then in even nations and people at one time seem to have the Israeli people's back. But, you know, it's not like a brand new thing either, though, Avi. We're seeing this from from all the way from 1947 when they gave a mandate uh, again, Resolution 181, and they were even then effectively trying to call for yet the land of Israel that was promised in 1922 to be divided again. Uh, and some of the things, the points that you're bringing out here, are, I think, are very important for the viewers to, to be able to hear this, especially the, the diverse audience that we have. Uh, even the Arabs that listen to Israeli News Live that feel that we're more uh, just in our, our view of things that are happening. Perhaps many of these Arabs do not know uh, that this is the case, that this is actually being used as a, a land from, from a document uh, from, from Jordan that's an illegal document, an illegal occupation of the Jordanians to begin with. Uh, I know recently my wife did an interview with a couple of ladies from Israel uh, here in Prague, and one of the things that they mentioned is that the majority of uh, Arabic women that are considered to be Palestinians do not want a second state. Uh, this was something they knew from their own friends. They said because they know that if there's a two-state solution, there's going to be Sharia law, and they like the freedoms that Israel has to offer for women and the right. equality, that they, equality they have. Uh, I wanna, I, I'll, I'll use this as, a, as, as an opportunity to just speak to your Arab Muslim public, a message that I hammer in my programming um, and in all of my, all of my work that I do is Israel is, if not the best, one of the best places for an Arab Muslim to live in the Middle East. They have total freedom. In Israel, a Muslim can be a police, a police, not just a police officer, but one of the, the police commissioners. He could be a Supreme Court judge. He can be in the he could be in politics. They're not only as they'll know are apartheid, Muslims are celebrated now full equality. Does it mean there is no racism in Israel? Well, is there no racism right. in any country? Of course there I mean, that, that has to do with people, but not on the government level. There's no apartheid in Israel. Things have to be changed in every society, whether blacks, whites, yellow, brown, yes. religious, Christians, Muslims. Every country has its issues. But for people to be going around and saying that Israel is an apartheid state, Muslims have the most unbelievable freedom of movement, of religion, like in no other Middle Eastern country. If you're in a Sunni Muslim country, then you're oppressed. Then you oppress Shiites. If you're a Shiite, then you're oppressed. Sunnis, if you're a Christian yes. or Yazidis, then you're oppressed. Israel, Yazidis, Christians, Jews, Muslims all have freedom of religion, freedom of movement, freedom to have the same jobs, freedom to be politicians, freedom to be police officers, Supreme Court judges, everything. So it's just sad. The irony is so sad 
because the one country Muslims should be looking up to to emulate for their countries and to be inspired by is Israel, the one country that their leadership, religious and political, vilify on a daily basis. You know, Avi, it's true. And um, one thing that's interesting as well, as you said, uh, the, the Arab people can participate in any parts of government at all. The, and, and in reality, I don't know if this is the case or not, but they could probably even be elected as a prime minister. Uh, I, I don't of know if that's, you know, so it, it is absurd what's going on. And, um, and, and we're watching this. And, and at the same time, when we mention uh, the word apartheid, the very resolution of 1947, Resolution 181, is the most apartheid resolution that I've ever seen in my life because the very language itself requires that there will be no Arabs living in the Jewish land and there will be no Jews living in the Arab land. That is apartheid. And we know that the Israeli people would never accept no Arabs living in their land. It is part of the commandments that was given through Moses that those that want to, to, to live by the laws of our land, that we're to live together as brothers and as neighbors. And, and so I think it is absurd. Let's, Avi, let's move in towards the, the, the friends that you have living in Amona. I would like to, to go, if you can express to us what this has done to them. I mean, you're thinking, we're looking at 20 years and they, and they really come down hard on the young people. I, I even saw, um, uh, you know, some of, some of the articles that came out, one in particular, which was kind of disheartening. Uh, I know that uh, the justice minister, um, uh, Ms. Sheikh, you know, no doubt if she said they tried their best to do what they could, uh, but because of some of the actions of the residents that they claim, now I say it's alleged, I don't know if it's true or not, they were using chemical stuff, throwing on the police because they didn't want to leave the synagogue that was there. Uh, but nonetheless, one thing that I do try to keep in mind, these young people there, this is, the only home they've ever known. And, uh, and, and, and I'll just share some of the photos here on the screen as well for, for our viewers to look at here, uh, especially this, this particular image here, Avi, I'm sure you can see this as well. All these police pushing one woman down a hill. I mean, this is absurd. And then they wonder why residents- I wanna clarify there's something, Steve. Sure. I wanna clarify something very important. First of all, two points. The pictures you are showing right now are not from last week. These pictures are from 11 years ago when the, the Omer government forcibly destroyed nine houses in Amona. Wow. And it was much more violent back then. It was a different government. It was a very anti-settler government. It was a, a Prime Minister Ehud Olmert said that uh, he, was look, he was looking to do a disengagement from the West Bank, just like Sharon did from the Gaza Strip. It was a very anti-settler uh, anti settlement government, and it was, there was much more violence back then. Nobody wanted that amount of violence now. So those pictures did not repeat themselves now. That What you are referring to um, in terms of whatever things might have been thrown at the police officers, again, I also want to clarify and separate. The, it was done by youth who did not grow up there. That's we a good a point. And the, we are youth who feel that we're being betrayed, again, because of the absurdity, because of the illegal and immoral aspect of this. They couldn't be silent while 42 families are expelled from their homes and homes are destroyed. So they were there protesting. <coughs> Most of the protesting was peaceful. It was them sitting um, hand to hand. Uh, elbow to elbow, hooked up, so that it took hours for them to be uh, evacuated from each and every home. But again, whatever uh, acts of violence, which are very minimal, very again, exactly. uh, against violence, but even if you consider what was happened, people being expelled from their homes, and all that was done was just some things being thrown at them, or some liquids, I don't think they were dangerous liquids, regardless, it shouldn't be done, but it was still done on a very low level, and it was done by youth who do not live there. The families who live there uh, all, I wouldn't say, it, it, they were all peaceful. They were dragged out because you don't want to just walk out peacefully. No, out I understand. House. So as an act of defiance, they were taken out of their homes. But the families and children of the families who lived there were not involved in any of that low level of violence. So I do believe it is just an excuse by the powers that be to further... Uh, 
use the families of Amona as an example, which are only gonna are only pushing more and more youth to have less and less trust in the government system and the legal system. Here you'd think, okay, a, a law, the law was made. The Supreme Court made its decision, all right? It, it forced Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's hand, even though he didn't want to do this. We all understand that, even though we are upset. And we all understand we have to change the, the legal system and the Supreme Court system. Once the Supreme Court did that and the government had to do that, then we're all playing a game. We're all pawns in this game. Um, and unfortunately, there are those who, even though 42 families are being expelled from their homes, still want to do, it, do, do as much bad as possible to them and make an example of them, instead of saying, I'm sorry we had to do this, and you guys are unfortunately pawns who just lost your homes, but we're going to give you a big hug and try to help you as much as possible. So it's really, it saddens me that people are using whatever low levels of violence that youth from outside, they weren't even living there, from outside were using as an excuse to, to try to hold up whatever other agreements are helping out these families. It really saddens me. Well, it's important, though, to bring it up because now we have the truth of the story, Avi, and that, that's what's important because otherwise, if we brush it under the rug, then they would think that we're just trying to hide something. And it's important to note that it's not the residents themselves. So the question really comes down to is, who are the youth that actually came in? And of course, is it because they are disturbed about what's happening in their government? Uh, there's a lot that could be said there, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it could have also been done intentionally to try to make the residents of Amona look bad by sending in a couple of bad eggs that maybe have nothing to do with anything and that are just posing as supposedly supporter of the residents of Amona. So it's important to know, and I think it should be clarified for the listening audience as well, that the residents of Amona were not involved in these acts uh, that, that, are, that were being reported in Hararetz, which is another thing that did disturb me. I noticed Hararetz uh, actually in their own article call this illegal occupation. And I think that's an unfair thing to say, especially in light of the facts that we know now, that is not a fair assumption to say about Amona. Amona was not an illegal occupation whatsoever. Uh, let me ask you another thing too, Avi, kind of in closing here, I'm really concerned about this. I know that this happened back years ago uh, when the, uh, the settlements that were destroyed uh, down near Gaza, the residents, in many cases, the banks, there were no forgiveness of the loans. They had to continue to pay for the loans. They were not giving anything in return for this. Are the, are the residents of Amona going to face the same situation that they have, uh, they have loans with banks that are not going to forgive these debts? Uh, what's going to happen to the residents now? Okay. Uh, you know, uh, he will be able to give you more detailed information about that if he even knows the information. He is a resident of Amona. He's been living there, I don't know whether 20 years, but close to 20 years. He was there until the end. Um, I interviewed him on Tuesday, the day before he was removed from his house. He will have more of the details by the, uh, about that. But my, my guess is... I was very, very involved. Let me take a step back. I was very involved with the with the struggle of the Jewish families in Gaza, in Gush Katif, in Gaza, 12 years ago. That actually started my whole media career. Before that, I was an organizational psychologist for a bank, and uh, because of my involvement with the struggle for Gush Katif, I turned into a media personality. I turned into a movie maker, and now I, I use social media like you to tell the truth about the Jewish people and the land of Israel to the world via my website, IsraelVideoNetwork.com. So I was very involved back then. There is a major, major difference between today and 12 years ago with what happened to the families from Gush Katif. And that is today the government is pro-settlement. 12 years ago, Ariel Sharon, even though he is one of the fathers of the settlement movement, here's an interesting piece of information I don't know if you knew. The families of Amona are there partly because of Ariel Sharon. Ariel Sharon knew that there was anti-settler movement developing around the world that was going to go crashing down on Israel, and he made out a call to Israelis to settle the hilltops. So many of the hilltops, including Amona 20 years ago, were settled because Ariel Sharon called upon Israelis to settle them. Wow. And again, at the time, it was the government that allowed all that settlement activity to happen. Anyone who says anything's illegal, I mean, here's another absurdity. Even if you'd say it's illegal, but the government provided all the infrastructure, the government provided the financing. So these people didn't do anything wrong. If 
if anything, it was who did some, who did, who made a mistake and did something wrong. It's the government that has to come up with a solution, not for the individual people to pay a price. But here, the media, the messaging, the legal system has made it out as if the people themselves are the ones who are lawbreakers. No! First of all, it was not illegal. And even if you say it was illegal, it was the government that sent them there in the first place. So the government that has a solution. But you definitely see anyone, if you really do, if you really do research, you're really interested in the truth, not in terms of, of what art is. And I, I definitely tell people, people don't read our arts. Israel read our it is the least read paper in Israel. It is known to be extremely anti-Israel. It's our own newspaper, and it's anti-us. It's anti a strong Jewish Israel. It, 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 strong Jewish Israel. Don't read Haaretz. Don't trust it. It is very slant, slanted. It's like the Guardian or the New York Times or the Huffington Post in terms of its anti-Israel slant. Uh, Israelis don't read that paper. Um, but again, anyone who's really honest with what's going on here and the history. You could just look at Ariel Sharon himself. He was the father of the settler movement. He pushed for many settler set settlements to be established because he knew it was, it's not just good for the Jews, it's good for the Muslims. Wherever Jews are, Muslims are safe. It's that simple. So whenever we are, Muslims are safe. Today, they're not safe under Hamas. I just met a Muslim this weekend over Shabbat in my house. His father secretly helped Israel because Hamas was killing his family members. He was living in Gaza. Wow. His family was helping the Israeli army because Hamas kills them indiscriminately. They are a their own people. So he now lives in Israel. He escaped because he was helping Israel. He escaped. He's now his son now serves in the Israeli army. Any Muslim who wants to be honest with themselves, intellectually honest, you have to support Israel. Where we are Jews, where the Jews are safer. I don't know if you ever saw the, the video of the One State Solution by, um, I forgot his name. Um, a very, very popular, millions of views, called the One State Solution. He's, it's in humor. What was his One State Solution? The whole Middle East becomes under Israel, right? Because then all the Muslims in the whole Middle East are safer and there's equality for all because Israel's in yes. charge. And it's, and it's a sad joke, but it's true. That would be true if that would actually happen. Um, but again, anyone who follows the true history, Ariel Sharon, for that reason, then turned. He, he, he was extremely pro-settlement. He knew it was the best for the region. It was best for Israel, best for our Arab Muslim neighbors. And then all of a sudden, because of whatever pressures of the elite, he there it turned. Is. Yes. Um, but all of these settlements were settled legally, either with, with assistance from the government. So it, it is Amazing. all a game. It, we're, we're all Sand is being thrown in all of our eyes by politicians, by media. And it's wonderful that programs like yours, and there are now outlets like mine, IsraelVideoNetwork.com, where people can be able to see the truth behind, be, be, beyond the headlines, beyond the mass media that is really not giving us that truth. Yes, Avi, in closing here, if you can share with the people, you have a couple of times here. Did you, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you also do uh, the 12 Tribe films. Is that correct, Avi? Correct, correct. Yes, uh, if you can uh, just share with the people, it'll be on the screen for them as well, where they can find. And, and by the way, friends, when, listen, when you're listening uh, to this broadcast, check out the description below. All of Avi's information will be there. You need to get educated on what's going on. And I agree with Avi Har. It's, it's definitely not the, the news source. I myself prefer Israel National News. Uh, they seem to be a little bit more open about that, uh, especially even like Giulio Miotti, a good friend of mine, Italian journalist who's not Jewish, uh, but he as well. When you mention elites, uh, Giulio Miotti has been trying to get the world to realize the Vatican's uh, role in trying to gain control of Jerusalem. Uh, and I think this is where, I to, uh, just, just a little thought, thought I'll throw in here real quick too, Avi. I believe that that might have a lot to do with the prophecy by Daniel when he says that they come up strong with a small people. Um, it's clearly Esau's descendants. Any, any good Jewish guy knows that uh, we believe that Esau is Rome. And that, uh, and and of course, that small people, I believe, are what they call themselves the Palestinians. I think that's the small people, and they're in the pal. Unfortunately, these Arabic people are being used as a pawn, and they have no idea that they're being used as a pawn. Avi, share with us your information here, and I want to thank you so much for for coming on with us here. Um, and it's, it's, I believe that this is going to be really shared. I encourage everybody, please make it, let, let everybody know, share this everywhere you possibly can. I know there's a lot of networks that'll pick this up as well. Share it as much as you can, uh, to get this message out. Avi, 
Tell us more about yourself. Sure, sure. Right before I, uh, my information is simple. My uh, what started what started my whole media uh, involvement was a movie I produced called Home Game about the family, the last youth basketball tournament in Gush Katif. In gives the whole human story. That's what started this all. Ended up a nonprofit and a company. Twelve tribe films. Now our, our major um, property on the internet is Israel is IsraelVideoNetwork.com. We put out 15, 20 new videos a day. Uh, you can find us on Facebook also on Israel Video Network. Anyone can find me on social media by my name. I'm personable. I'm out there. I'm giving my own commentaries about everything on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat under my name Avi Abelo. Anyone can easily follow me and reach out to me. And uh, just I like I like oh, ending on an optimistic mystic no depressed it's so sad what's going on uh injustice well it's always been injustice there's always been an abuse of power by powerful people nothing changed must throughout history but i am very optimistic because something is changing us we are making the change we are bringing about a different world whether it's brexit in in britain whether it's trump in america whether it's 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 a more a Jewish oriented Israel. We are all part of the change for the betterment of all humanity. I think it's interesting. The progressive left, they are coming out and be, to being more, it's more clear of their hypocrisy day by day. People who've been sitting on the fence up until now are now sitting saying, wait a second, they make no sense whatsoever. They're protesting in the streets for these Muslim immigrants, but, but there really is a problem with some Muslim immigrants. Oh, like, okay, there is a bit, maybe there's a better way to deal with it, but no, Western freedom and civilization are under attack. And how can, how can all of this energy be, be put out there to stand up for Muslim immigrants? What, why weren't they standing up in the streets for the millions being, being massacred in Syria and the Middle East when they were being killed? Why are they? Yes. to America. It makes no sense. Their hypocrisy is coming out. They're standing on their hind legs, I believe. And I believe the stronger your voice is, the stronger my voice is, all of the listeners, be involved, be part of the change, share the information, share the truth. If there's information that you're confused about, reach out to Steve, reach out to me, reach out to people in the know to learn the truth. We are part part of the change to be making the world a better place. I believe Israel is on its way to be a much better place because hopefully the elites are on their way down. I think under Trump, the elite in America are definitely feeling that. Europe, I'm not as optimistic about, unfortunately, but Britain has a chance. But again, things are changing. And instead of just complaining or focusing and being depressed, you can be part of the change to put uh, of optimism for everybody. I agree so much. Avi, thank you for, for being here with us today. Thank you guys for watching. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom.